Hi, and welcome to the End Times Guy podcast. Great to have you joining me. I hope you can entertain me today as I put on my tinfoil hat and go through a few pieces of the puzzle that I've been fitting together, sorting out, and, you know, a picture is starting to become more clear, and I want to share that with you. And it goes hand in hand with both the, the Tower of Babel and so-called ancient aliens. And I use the word ancient aliens because we have been visited a number of times from entities that are not of this world. Doesn't mean they came from another world. It just means they're not of this world. So they are extraterrestrial, but they're not from another planet. And we do have evidence of that in that these UFO sightings, um, they suddenly appear on radar. They suddenly appear in the sky as if they're coming from somewhere else. We don't track them moving in and out of our solar system. They just appear and then disappear. And it's becoming difficult to deny their existence. Um, if you saw the footage of the UFO over Jerusalem, a UFO dropped down, hovered above the Dome of the Rock, and then shot up skyward. It was captured from a number of different angles, from a number of different cameras, and it's, it's pretty hard to refute. But just recently, the Navy accidentally released, or it was leaked from the Navy, footage from actual fighter jets. This isn't someone's GoPro. This is the surveillance systems on these fighter jets have recorded cigar-shaped UFOs flying in ways that human aircraft simply can't fly. And, you know, are we getting closer to the, uh, what do they call that? Disclosure, full disclosure. As the world becomes more and more aware through the internet, more and more able to share their own experiences, it's getting harder and harder to refute the idea that something is going on. And if you look at things like Operation High Jump, where they sent, um, what was it, 5,000 men, military men, plus 11 or 12 warships and a submarine on a quote-unquote scientific um, expedition to Antarctica. And something went seriously sideways. They were supposed to be down there for six months, and they cut their expedition way short. I think they were only down there a month, and they lost one military ship, a bunch of men, and claimed they were attacked by flying craft that moved with extraordinary speed and agility. Um, you also have the uh, battle over Los Angeles, I believe it was, another aerial battle that was very hard to explain. So these things have been going on for a while, and I'm going to play around with that terminology of extraterrestrials, UFOs, and visitations as we go back in time. Now, first of all, we know that the Earth had an extraterrestrial visit in the Garden of Eden. There was a creature there that didn't belong there, that was from off planet. And we call him Lucifer. He entered the garden and took up, sparked up a conversation with the woman. And what was the goal of this conversation? Why did this entity make contact with the woman? Strangely, it was to deceive her. And what deception was it he was working at, at its most rudimentary level? He was telling the woman that God is a liar. Very strange that an extraterrestrial would come to this planet with the sole purpose of proving that God is a liar. Very interesting. And he's, he succeeded. It went really badly for us. I'm just going through some construction right now. Yeah, Got to pay attention. Flaggers hate it when they get run over. And I kind of understand that. But, you know, they get paid well. So part of the job, right? Uh, a little sip of water. Um, that was our first experience with extraterrestrial life on this planet. But that wasn't our last experience. The first visit cost us our place before God. From what I understand, Adam and Eve were so wretchedly miserable after they were booted out of the garden because they just weren't removed from a nice place. 
they were utterly changed by this. Their whole makeup, their, their way of understanding, their communion with God, nothing was the same. And they were both absolutely wretched and didn't want to live. Um, our second visitation came about a thousand years later. And this was a big one. This was big. This was kind of, imagine today uh, a race of aliens present themselves to humanity. And they have all kinds of high-tech stuff. And they, they tell us that they seeded the planet millions of years ago. And they've come to check on their children how many people today would buy into that? How many would be like, well, that explains everything. I honestly, today, I think most people would buy right into it and never doubt it. Well, something like that happened about a thousand years after creation. Um, now, I want you to imagine these quote unquote extraterrestrials are actually fallen angels and they're all huddled. They, they love our creation. They want to get into our creation. And because they're angels, they can, you, you see, our reality isn't the same as theirs at all. Our reality is much, much lower and more basic than their reality is. In fact, our reality to them is, uh, just to simplify it, is like a stubbornly persistent illusion. Think of it as a hologram. To them, it's a hologram. But they really, really like this hologram and they want to be a part of it. So they huddle up these fallen angels and Lucifer has been selling it to them for a while now. How good it is and how beautiful the women are and how wonderful everything is and how happy they are and blah, blah, blah. And they're all convinced that this is exactly what they want to be a part of. They, they make an oath, in fact, to um, <clears throat> they will go to the earth together. And take for themselves wives and they bind themselves to an oath because, you know, they didn't want to just go by themselves because they knew that God was going to judge them for this. They knew there was going to be, well, for lack of a better word, hell to pay. <laughs> but uh, they, they all bound themselves to an oath and committed to coming to the earth for the second visitation that humanity has experienced. They huddled up and they discussed, how do we want to present ourselves? And one said, why don't we just go in as them, as humans, and we'll, we'll pretend we, we're in a village over here. And, you know, um, Azazel cuffs him on the back of the head and says, dummy, we're gods to them. Come on, let, we're going to go in as gods. And, and the rest love this idea. And, and they actually laugh because it's so absurd, but it's still funny. They still really like the idea. And that's exactly what they do. Uh, in the days of Jared, 200 of them appear on Mount Horeb and, you know, attention earthlings, attention earthlings. We are the aliens. We are your gods. We are here to rule you. And they begin to rule mankind. Now, here's some of the things they did. They began to teach us uh, all, all that we know today, arithmetic, writing, art, metalwork, root cutting, astrology, astronomy, agriculture, you name it, all the sciences began with them. Did you know they taught us abortion? A thousand years before the flood, we were doing abortion. They had a drink that women could drink and they'd never get pregnant again. Or if you had a pregnant wife and you didn't want to have a baby, no problem. This is how you hit her right here, just like that, and she'll lose the baby. And this is what they taught us. These were not benevolent beings, okay? Man learned all of these wonderful skills, created for himself weapons, went to war with one another, learned adultery and all the rest of it, learned civilization. And one of the things, the these fallen angels really wanted uh, their, their ego hounds, their glory hounds. I mean, in their own minds now, they are gods. And a god should have a temple, a monument dedicated to their glory. So they set about, they took their children, which were basically demigods, half fallen angel and half human, what the Bible calls Nephilim or giants or Anunnaki. They, they, uh, 
got their children to work, put them to work, building temples to their glory. And we see the evidence of that on the earth today. Some of these structures survived the flood. If you can believe it, a worldwide cataclysm that destroyed, wiped out all life on the earth. Some of these structures survived that. Um, if you look in Lebanon, the temple of Jupiter, beneath the um, basic stonework of the Romans, you'll see the foundation stones were built in such a way that we could never match today. And the Romans certainly didn't. Um, one of the stones weighs, they, they guesstimate, we have no way of knowing for sure, about 1,400 tons. We couldn't lift that stone today if we surrounded it with cranes. If we got every crane in there that could get a hook on this thing, we couldn't pick it up. And they were carving these and hauling them five miles and lifting them 30 feet in the air and placing them with such precision you couldn't get a razor blade between them. No, this isn't the work of humans. It's not. You see this in Pumu Punku in Bolivia and all around the world, these megalithic structures made in a way that man can't match today, can't achieve today. In Pumu Punku, the, the stones are made of diorite, which is harder than steel. You can't cut it without a diamond. And these stones are cut magnificently. They're all one-offs. They're not made from a mold. They're one-offs cut individually with uh, ruler straight edges, interlocking blocks, just magnificent, magnificent structures. And, and the one in Pumupunku, Bolivia, look, appears to have been blown to pieces. Now think about that. Walls harder than steel are blown to pieces. There was a tremendously violent explosion, but what kind of technology could blow up something like that? It certainly wasn't a nuke. Um, this is what they were busy doing. And their depravity spread all over the world. They came in and just made a hell of a mess of the whole earth. And if my use of the word hell offends you, I apologize for that. Um, but I'm also a truck driver and I don't pretend to be anyone else. I just, this is the way I talk and I, I'm not someone else now than I am at other times. So pardon me if that word offends you. But um, this is what brought the judgment of God. The visitors, the extraterrestrials, had turned the hearts of men so that they were so busy doing wickedness, they had utterly forgotten the Lord their God. They thought nothing of righteousness. It's pretty clear whose side we were on now. We were all cheering, you know, Nephilim, Nephilim, and, and praising these quote unquote gods and their great temples and the wonderful uh, societies that were established. And uh, the, all these so called gods were being praised and worshiped. And, you know, they had their drama, they had their battles between one another because they were carnally minded and. And if you look in, in uh, a lot of religions on the planet, this is the way they perceive the gods as being um, some of them deceptive, some of them um, sneaky, underhanded, traitorous, and, uh, you know, very many gods. Well, these are our traditions passed on from this very time. And God sends the flood, but before he does, he has to tie up the 200 fallen angels and he throws them into a pit in the earth. And that's where they are to this very day. They are to remain under the earth until judgment day. And that's what I honestly think Hitler was doing down in Antarctica at the end of World War II. And, you know, they set up their Nazi base down there. And if you look at Operation High Jump in, uh, I believe it was 1950 something. An American expedition down to Antarctica, 5,000 military men, 11 warships and a submarine on a quote unquote scientific expedition. They want the same thing hidden down there that Hitler wanted. You know, they took the Nazi scientists, many of them in Operation Paperclip after the, the end of World War II 
and learned an awful lot from them. And that's what sent them on Operation High Jump down to Antarctica in, in the 1950s was to get whatever it was that Hitler wanted to get his hands on down there. But they were met with some very fierce resistance. It was supposed to be a six-month expedition manned with 5,000 soldiers, 11 military ships, a military submarine, and all kinds of airplanes and everything else. Well, they returned a month and a bit later with their tail between their legs. They'd lost a military ship and barely escaped with their lives. And they claimed that these aircraft were dive bombing them and attacking them. And they flew with tremendous speed. Ah, what's going on down there? You think maybe there's something buried in the ground down there and God says, keep your hands off? I'm just putting pieces of the puzzle out there. You may fit them in differently and it makes more sense. That's great. I just want to share my pieces with you and, and you fit them together wherever they fit. But uh, that, that's a possibility, a strong possibility. That's where these uh, 200 fallen angels are buried right now. But then the floodwaters wiped out all the Nephilim, all the demigods. Now, here's the thing about the demigods. They did not come from anywhere else. They came from this planet. And they are tied to the fabric of this reality. They're not from a different reality. They're stuck here. They can't leave here. But because they're not holographic like we are, they can't interact with us directly. And that's got to be very, very frustrating. We're the Truman Show. They've been watching for thousands of years. And in Jesus' time, we see that they are invested very heavily in just messing with us. They seem to be taking a lot of pleasure in making us run naked through graveyards and foam at the mouth and jump into a fire and all this, jump into a lake and drown. They, they just seem intent on tormenting us. That's their mindless role is to torment us. But what's really interesting is that Jesus' uh, work through the gospel began to change things in the spiritual world. He began to establish a spiritual kingdom and we know that those who are born again are born into this spiritual kingdom. So there is something growing and developing in the spirit world that these demons can see. And it's changed their perspective. It's changed their, their modus operandi. <clears throat> they're, not, they're not content with just tormenting us any longer. They realize that there is an end game in place and they see the results of that. They see this kingdom growing and growing, and they're responding to that. Now, Satan is in damage control. <clears throat> he knows that Jesus is sending the signs on the earth right now to warn the people of his coming, of the soon coming judgment. It's God's will that not one human perish. He loves humans. He made humans. He gave humans this beautiful world. He, he made them to be his children. He loves every single one of us. He wants every single one of us saved. And he made salvation so simple. And this, this will give you an idea of how desperately God wants to save all of us. He sent his own son. He saw there was no other way to redeem us. He's a righteous God. He has to make us righteous, which means taking all the influence of these fallen angels and Nephilim out of us, purifying us, making us holy like he is. And the only way he could possibly do that was to directly give us his own righteousness. And the way he chose to do that was through the sacrifice of his son. By the shedding of innocent blood, Jesus Christ gave his life so that everyone who believes will have everlasting life. God Made it so simple. Do you believe me or do you believe them? Are you with me or are you with them? If you believe God, then believe his word. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord and believe with your heart. God has raised him from the dead. You will be saved. And you know when you're saved, it's called being born again. You feel different. You feel the weight of your sin being lifted off your shoulders and you feel joy. And you realize in that instant that all of this is true. I'm not just some nut job with a tinfoil hat. This is reality. So 
God is pulling out all his stops. He's reaching out with all his might to save as many of us as possible. And Satan knows that time is short. So damage control. How does he cover up the signs? How does he make people believe that these signs aren't really signs of Jesus coming? Climate change. It's a great answer. Um, Man-made climate change. And now when most people experience horrific weather, uh, you know, or see all the violent earthquakes or all the weirdness going on around us, they're thinking climate change instead of what's going on. Is Jesus returning? So he's managed to reduce the effects of the signs for a great many people. But that's not all they're busy doing. If you're the demons and you see that he is, the Lord is building a spiritual kingdom and you want to get into humanity to influence it, how, how do these demons go about that? You know, at, I think for a very long time, they've been struggling for a new way to enter humanity the way they did um, through uh, the Tower of Babel, the gateway of the gods. I, I think they're trying desperately to get back into our reality. I think that's what CERN was all about. And so far, I don't think it's been successful. But there was a particle appeared in the Large Hadron Collider that it was an anomaly it came from nowhere so they were able to open some kind of doorway and something came through but what exactly they don't know but i believe that's what cern is about and that's what i believe all this ufo nonsense is about as well the cattle mutilations that we had back in the uh when was that the 70s and 80s herds of cattle were were being mutilated and certain parts of them much of the anatomy of cows and genitalia were being taken and the rest of the cow left dead on the ground the cuts weren't being done with a butcher knife the cuts were done with laser-like precision and they didn't bleed profusely either so it's like a laser was cutting these animals open and i believe the aliens were trying to make for themselves some sort of biological suit they could occupy in this world i mean that's how they have to um interact in our reality is to come in in a form that is that is uh, of our reality and, and you know when you see these images of the grays and the striking similarity in all the different um accounts of encountering them that's what i think they made with, with all these body parts and with all the abductions and the messing around with human uh, reproductive organs, I believe they were trying to manufacture for themselves some sort of biological entity they could occupy. But um, I believe we're, we're due for another grand visitation. And this is a hypothesis that I want us to be aware of and prepared for. I believe it's very possible if they are successful in creating for themselves some means of, of bodies they can occupy that don't look ridiculous, that they are going to present themselves as our gods all over again. That they're going to say they seeded this planet millions of years ago. They've returned to see how their children are doing. They've brought all kinds of wonderful technology to us. And it's just going to be like their fathers all over again. But here's the, here's the fun part. They know for a fact Jesus Christ is coming to judge the world. Now, these demons don't want to present themselves to the earth as demons because, hey, we all there, you know, the word of God is spread throughout the world enough that everyone knows what demons are. And if they present themselves for what they are, they're going to be attacked. They're going to be rejected and resisted. But if they present themselves as aliens, as benevolent entities who gave us life, they're going to be received much better and treated probably like gods. And when the day of the Lord's return approaches. Can you imagine them sounding the alarm bells and saying, there, there's a dangerous race of aliens moving against our planet. We have to defend ourselves. Emergency, get out the nukes and the jets and 
and we have to do battle with this this evil race of aliens that's coming and this is our armageddon the world gathers to fight against jesus christ now we who know the word of god know that there is no battle whatsoever it's only their death that's all that results from this is their immediate extinction but this is the final wonderful deception of the human race and i don't want us to think in terms of white and black or arab and caucasian or you know men and women and all the different barriers that divide humanity god made man god made us in his image and we humans can have total unity in christ and you see that in many many churches around the world um arabs and indians and chinese and whites all together as brothers and sisters no distinction between them at all the world could be one in christ and the world will be one in christ when he sets up the millennial kingdom but satan is doing everything in his power to destroy as many of us as possible before that day comes and it's god's will for his children to warn as many as possible just get the word out you don't have to try and convince them to go to your church just get the word out in any means available to you make a tract distribute it do a youtube video do a podcast whatever it takes just get the word out let people know they are humans just like you and god loves them just like you let them know make them aware before it's too late thanks for joining me today i'm taking off my tinfoil hat now god bless